Our next speaker is Alex van Leeuwen. And Alex is a current MINEC CRC PhD candidate at the University of South Australia. And his research involves the unraveling of timing, duration, and driving forces of metamorphism in geologically complex regions. So please welcome Alex. Hi everyone, uh, yeah, so my name is Alex Van Leeuwen um, and I'm going to be talking to you guys a bit about uh, quite an interesting aspect of uh, the Kernamona province or the geology of the Kernamona province and that being that the rocks there are quite anomalously enriched in heat producing elements um, and therefore they generate quite a lot of heat and I want to kind of explore what the implications of that have been for uh, metamorphism or the metamorphic evolution of the region. Um, before I get into things, I'd like to just thank uh, all of my co-authors co and supervisors, uh, along with MINEC CRC for really providing me the opportunity and the supervision to, to get this work done um, and present it today. So, cool, that works. Um, all right, so how do we produce heat in rocks? So basically all rocks contain uh, some concentration of uh, the elements potassium, thorium and uranium. Uh, Quite often they're in quite low abundances, just aside from potassium, but thorium and uranium are in quite low concentration typically. But in some instances, particularly in mid to upper crustal rocks, in felsic lithologies and metasedimentary rocks or sedimentary rocks, um, we can have quite high concentrations of thorium and uranium in particular. Um, and when you have such high concentrations of rocks, um, such high concentrations of these elements, we can generate quite a lot of heat because they decay radioactively and as that happens, they generate heat. Um, and when you do have concentrations like this, you can drive metamorphism effectively. You're adding thermal energy into the, into the crust. So um, what I want to look at is how metamorphism, um, what the characteristics of metamorphism driven in this style are, um, and how we can sort of fingerprint this. And the Kernamone is really the ideal way to do this. So overall, just as a, a, a summary to start, is uh, this style of metamorphism is characterised by high thermal gradients, meaning that Temperatures in the crust get quite hot with quite shallow depth um, and they can be characterised by quite long thermal durations and that's because of these elements here, they have quite long half lives so you see 4.5 billion years, 14 billion years. So these elements can generate heat for very long periods of time. So we have the potential to drive long duration metamorphism effectively. So uh, the Kernamona province. So, uh, a, bit about, a bit of a high level overview of the geology of the Kernamona. Uh, so here's just a solid geology map um, of the province. Um, and we can see that the, the rocks are, are dominated by sort of metasedimentary uh, or paleo to mesoproterozoic age metasedimentary and igneous rocks. We also have some neoproterozoic and paleozoic uh, sedimentary rocks and intrusives as well. But the real focus of this talk is going to be these uh, paleo to mesoproterozoic metasedimentary rocks and igneous rocks. Uh, which, as we'll see on the next slide, are responsible for generating quite a lot of heat. So, um, here is a, a series of heat production maps, uh, and these have just been calculated by taking airborne radiometric data that maps the concentration of uranium and thorium and potassium, and calculating what the present day heat production at the surface is for these rocks. And we can see on these insets, which correspond to the northwestern Kernamona and southern Kernamona, that um, the basement lithologies or the basement rocks, these paleo to uh, mesoproterozoic uh, igneous and metasedimentary rocks, which are outlined in white, um, have really quite high heat production rates, uh, especially when compared to average rock types, average metasediments or average igneous rocks. They're about two to five times higher than um, their, their equivalent counterparts. So, um, first off, I want to look at the North, the northwestern Kernamona province, sort of in the Arkarula region, and then in the sort of latter half of this talk, I'll give some insights into um, the southern Kernamona. So, to start off, heading to the northwest in the Arkarula region, here we can see in a bit more high resolution detail um, what the heat production distribution looks like um, in, in the Arkarula region. So, we have the Mount Babbage Inlier and the Mount Pater Inlier. Um, and these regions, uh, these, these rocks, um, are really some of the highest heat producing rocks on Earth. So the Urala granite up here in the Mount Babbage Inlier, that is actually the highest measured, um, or the, has the highest heat production measurement known on Earth so far. Um, it's around 61 microwatts, and that's uh, about 10 time, 20 times greater than a, a, an average granite. So 
the, the, the title of these slides, uh, a chemical hotspot, is really not an exaggeration because these rocks here are quite unique in the fact that they can generate a lot of heat, um, especially under the right conditions. So we wanted to look at this region to sort of build a framework of what metamorphism driven by this style looks like. Because as I said before, at the beginning, um, this style of metamorphism is characterized by high thermal gradients and long durations. But a lot of our insights into this come from modeling or come from um, you know, uh, geophysical modeling of, of these rock systems. And we don't really have a good uh, handle on what this, how this style of metamorphism ma manifests itself in, in the metamorphic rock record. So what better place to look than Arcarola? So, uh, a bit more detail on the, on the geology of Arcarola. So here's sort of the southern part of, I'll go back, I'll go back, I won't, I'll go back. It's sort of this southern portion of the, of the Inlaw, um, and uh, of the Mount Painter Inlaw. And we can see in the blue and purple and reds, they are the basement rocks, the high heat producing um, Proterozoic basement rocks. And these are overlain by a sequence of near Proterozoic sediments, or sedimentary rocks, the, the Adelaide Rift Complex, or. Adelaide Super Basin, um, whatever we want to call them. And these are the sort of basal portions, the Kalana and Umbaratna groups. And in here, we see right close to the boundary or the, the unconformity with the basement, the rocks contain mineral assemblages that are indicative of having undergone high thermal gradient metamorphism. When elsewhere in the, in the Flinders Ranges where we see these outcropping, they only experience sort of green schist, facies metamorphism. So they have sort of chlorite, muscovite assemblages. So quite low grade metamorphism. But we see the rocks here contain an abundance of cordierite porphyroblasts, and cordierite is kind of a, a nice uh, metamorphic uh, indicator mineral for this style of metamorphism that occurs under quite high thermal gradients. And we can see uh, some mapping that's been done of the cordierite isograd. Um, it kind of mimics the geometry of the, of the basement itself, right? It, it's almost reminiscent of a metamorphic contact aureole or something like that. And in that sort of scenario, you'd have a molten pluton emplacing itself into some cooler country rocks, and you form this sort of metamorphic halo around it. But we know that these rocks are about 1,500 to 1,600 million years old, and the age of metamorphism is about 500, 580 million years old. So there's a billion year age gap between these rocks and the age of metamorphism. So we can automatically rule out a conventional sort of magmatic driving force for this metamorphism. So, um, what we did is we decided to date, um, using monazite, a bunch of these, of these uh, metamorphose uh, sedimentary rocks, these cordierite bearing assemblages that I just showed. Um, and what we can see when you apply uranium lead dating uh, is that the data is spread over quite a long period of time, um, quite a, a, a smear, if you'd call it, a long concordia um, of, of these uranium lead dates. Um, and this is kind of indicative of a long thermal duration, because if we have metamorphism that's occurring via typical heating mechanisms like magmatism or uh, thinning of the crust or so on, we would expect to just have a nice cluster of dates along Concordia, it's sort of similar to this, but minus this sort of spread and protracted tail of dates um, to, the, to the younger ages. Um, and instead we see, as I say, this, 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 long, this long duration of metamorphism, and that's also backed up by the concentration of yttrium in these analyses. So the increasing concentration of yttrium through time is actually indicating that temperatures are increasing. Um, uh, and as I'll get into in the next slide, we think that's because uh, metamorphism was uh, actually, the, the, the burial depth of these rocks was increasing over time. And when you have high thermal gradients, um, the, the deeper you bury something in a high thermal gradient setting, the, hot, the, deeper, the, the hotter it's going to get, right? And in, in exceptionally high thermal gradient scenarios like this one, um, even small changes in burial depth can result in quite significant changes in temperature. Um, so what we've done here is we've organised um, the, the uh, geochronological data from a series of these um, samples that we've taken from, from around the inlier or around the basement. Um, and we've organised them from depth in the stratigraphic depth. So down the bottom here we have the deepest samples or the, the, the most deeply buried samples in the basin and then we have the shallowest sample and we see that the age of metamorphism, the onset of metamorphism increases from around 580 to 550 to 540 to 500 to 480 MA, consistent with this depositional framework. Um, because nicely, uh, in, in the Northern Flinders Ranges, we have quite a nice stratigraphic constraint, constrained by uh, detrital zircon geochronology and everything, and other such dating techniques, um, that constrain the timing of deposition of around a five kilometre thick package of sediments, the Wulpina group, occurred 
at 580 down to around 500 MA. So in this sort of 80 million year time window, we bury these basement rocks by about five kilometres. And as I said before, in these high thermal gradient settings, um, that can significantly increase the temperatures. Um, so it's almost like an on and off switch in this type of scenario. We have a long lived heat source, the heat source is not going away, but by burying or eroding these rocks, we can kind of turn on or off metamorphism. So it's quite cool to think about it like that. So um, that's kind of the, the northwestern Kernamona province summarised. And now we'll go down to the, the southern Kernamona. So here's that inset map before, and once again, the basement is outlined in these white um, polygons. Um, and what we immediately see is that the basement rocks here are not anywhere near as enriched in heat producing elements and have much lower heat production than the northwestern Kernamona province, unfortunately. But they're still really enriched when we compare it to average rock types, when we compare it to the, the, what's considered the norm in, 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 in crustal rocks. Um, they're still about two to three times more enriched and therefore they have the potential to drive metamorphism. And we know that this region, the southern Kernamona, so the, the Barrier Ranges in the Broken Hill region, the, in the Willyama Inlies in the Alari region, um, underwent a, quite a complex a period of metamorphism during the Mesoproterozoic. Um, but this has never been appraised, the, the, heat the heat production of these metasedimentary and igneous rocks has never been appraised in these metamorphic models before. So we thought it'd be a nice idea to kind of look at what the geochronology looks like and, and tells us and how we can draw inference from, from the, this new insight. Um, so, first of all, I did say that these rocks are rather unremarkable in terms of their heat production, but we have to also remember that metamorphism occurred during the Mesoproterozoic. So that's 1.6 billion years ago that, me that metamorphism was occurring. Um, and in that time, the, the concentration of these radioactive elements would have only increased because they decay as we go forward in time. So back calculating that, the concentration of these elements would increase, right? So during the Mesoproterozoic when metamorphic metamorphism was occurring, we see that the concentration, or the heat production, sorry, of, of, the, of the, the rocks in the, the basement rocks is about double than what it is today. So it's around four, four and a half microwatts. That's really, really hot, um, for those that don't know. Um, you know, average metasedimentary rocks are somewhere in the realm of one, one and a half microwatts. So it's, you know, more than double what an average metasedimentary rock would be. So it's a lot of thermal energy that's being produced by these rocks. So, the geochronology. So once again, this is a slightly different presentation of the data, but once again, we can see on these uranium lead Concordia diagrams, this is, these are analyses of monazite, um, we can see that it's spread over quite a long duration, you know, 80 to 100 million year duration sort of thing. Um, and that is really quite important because it's, it's, in, it's, it's once again a smoking gun for this type of type, style of metamorphism. Now granted, these different colours indicate that there's a bit more complexity to the data. It's not quite as clear cut as it is in Arcarola. There's a lot of uh, overprinting deformational episodes and so on, but that's what we really wanted to try and see through with this dating. So um, we threw the book at it, I guess you could say, in terms of petrochronology, um, and we dated monazite in a whole bunch of different microstructural locations. We dated zircon, we did some phase equilibrium modeling, um, garnet mapping, and a, a whole bunch of things that I won't <laughs> go into right now, but. Um, effectively, what we were able to, to discern from this is that we have an early generation of monazite that's hosted typically as inclusions within garnet or as these sort of preserved cores in monazite, and they date the onset of metamorphism to around, oops, I'm pointing at the wrong thing, uh, it's these purple ones, sorry. Um, they date the, 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 the timing of metamorphism to around 1630 to 1610 MA, the onset of, of, of high thermal gradient metamorphism. And then we have this sort of protracted sort of spread of dates, once again, that go all the way down to around uh, 1560, 1550 MA. So it's quite a long period of metamorphism and quite a long period of time where we actually have uh, a molten rock where we have, you know, uh, uh, anatectic conditions in the, lower, in the middle crust. So it's quite impressive that we can sustain that. And most importantly, the, petro the petrology of the rocks and the phase equilibrium modelling that we've done is, indicates that all of this occurred under the same... Uh, thermal gradient, right? Instead of having, uh, in normal tectonic heating environments where you have magmatism or, or say crustal rifting or something like that that's driving metamorphism, you wouldn't be able to sustain these high temperatures for that period of time. Instead you would have to have multiple pulses of tectonism or magmatism to introduce heat back into the crust and maintain these temperatures. And you would usually see some, some either magmatism that's overtly obvious elsewhere in the terrain um, or you would see um, you know, evidence for overprints or something like that. But we don't see that in these rocks. We just see evidence for a sort of a single long-lived event. And that's quite interesting because um, 
it, it really makes you reappraise these sort of old Proterozoic terrains. Um, and similarly, uh, just to sort of conclude, but similarly, there's some, been some recent work done in the southeastern Gawler Kratom um, by Mitchell Bachman and, and other co-authors, and that really reveals that even in the, on the other side, in the, in the southeastern Gawler, we have high enrichments of these radioactive elements in the basement rocks. Um, and that's driven long-lived metamorphism there as well during the Proterozoic. Um, so this is not a, a Kernamona restricted phenomena. It's really quite important for South Australian geology overall, where we have the uh, South Australian, uh, the South Australia heat flow anomaly, um, where we have this sort of high heat flow region. So this map's showing the, the, the Australia-wide heat flow database effectively. And here in South, central South Australia, we have a really high um, crustal heat flow values, and that's inferred to, to correspond to these high heat producing rocks um, that, are, that are basement to um, the, 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 the upper crustal successions. Uh, and this is important because, once again, when we have high concentrations of these elements, we have the, the, the potential to drive long thermal durations. And when rocks are hot for long periods of time, they're amenable to deformation during that period of time. Um, and that opens up broader deformation windows, broader mineralization windows, and so on. So this is quite an important thing to consider, um, I think, overall in the context of South Australian geology. So um, thanks for listening. Um, and that's effectively all I have to say. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>